it, this is sort of one of these wonderful parts of Australia, the snorkeling and diving is such a wonderful thing to do. And your backdrop is a testament to that, of course. Um, but in terms of um, reducing drowning, preventing drowning in this space, what are the key parts that you advocated into the Australian Water Safety Strategy? Oh, the main parts were, I think, the uh, medical medical uh, assessment of older divers is really important because we're finding that uh, at least 25% of the deaths these days, the diving at the snorkeling fatalities are cardiac related, right? So uh, it's, it's an older cohort of people participating often, certainly in scuba diving and also in snorkeling in certain areas and they're coming with cardiac baggage. So the med medical assessment is really important um, and it's underplayed. It used to be required that anyone doing a scuba course had to go through a full diving medical assessment. That's not the case now. There's a questionnaire and if people tick certain boxes on the questionnaire, they um, then um, need to go and have an assessment. And then you've got the issues of who does the assessment and what knowledge does that doctor have about the aquatic and especially the underwater environment? And that comes into play. Other key areas are who's accompanying you when you're going diving. And there's a buddy system in diving and snorkeling where you should be with a person that stays close with you, keeps a good eye on you, and you're doing the same with them, so that if something does go wrong, there's somebody at hand that can react really quickly. And a huge percentage of scuba divers, about 80%, um, well, not 80%, but over 50%, I think, were found not to have buddies um, um, at the time of their demise. And the same happens with snorkeling. So a lot of people just like to do it alone or separate or, or start off with a buddy and then get engrossed in their own activity. But they need to um, keep in mind that if something goes wrong, if it hits the fan, you want somebody there. Um, inexperience is an issue. Um, people having a break from diving or snorkeling and then coming back to it and thinking they're as good as they once were or never being that good in the first place. Inexperience, skill, um, lack of skill attention, uh, attainment or still skill degradation if they haven't been in for a while is an issue. So there's a whole bunch of things. And one that actually I thought uh, I was thinking about when you were talking about the rock fishing with the inflatable life jackets is buoyancy. Um, a lot of divers, in fact, 80% of scuba divers are found with their weights on. Um, so they actually have to be searched for found underwater, brought to the surface, brought on board a platform and managed for resuscitation. And divers don't do it very well, getting that positive buoyancy. So, you know, what we try and teach and try and embed as a safety message is that if somebody gets into trouble underwater, if they think they're going to go unconscious, they need to get positively buoyant. And you can do that by ditching your weight belt or inflating your buoyancy jacket. And a huge number of people just don't do that. And it, it's got to be sort of an embedded skill. And if somebody's tied up in the, you know, the mind numbing inertia of a, a diving emergency or an emergency, they don't always react right and automatically go and get themselves positively buoyant. And just going back to your rock fishing people and, and, and even on boats with uh, inflatable life jackets, that's one thing that I think... Uh, will be interesting to watch in the future. Um, in what circumstances do people actually inflate their jackets? Mm. Yeah, John, so, that, so you talk about cardiac baggage and um, dropping a weight belt and inflating a, a buoyancy jacket. These are all sort of individual responses. Are, are there any system-wide responses that we can use to uh, prevent drowning in uh, or scuba incidents? Well, education, education, education. So um, we need to educate the general community that might go diving and snorkeling or think about it, about health issues, about safety issues, about conditions, about weather, about uh, not going um, beyond their capabilities. 
we need to uh, educate the um, organisations involved in diving and, and keep them aware of what's happening with accidents and the type of uh, precipitants so that they can incorporate that in their organisational management in their training programs. We need to um, keep government on uh, informed about what's going on in this sphere, how significant a problem it is. And in different places, they see it as a different level of importance. For instance, in Queensland, where diving tourism is a, a fairly big market, um, they take it a lot more seriously and they have a regulated code of practice there to try and make the diving, standardise it more in the safety aspect, which isn't the case in pretty much every other place, jurisdiction. So government has a, has a role to play depending on the level of uh, um, morbidity and mortality in that area and what they think about it. Thanks, thanks, John. Amy, um, you, John, and actually lead author, I think, was Cody uh, from Canada. Cody Dunn or Cody Doon? I'm not sure. I, I've been saying Dunn and someone said Doon this morning. So Cody, a Canadian researcher. Can you uh, clarify his surname? Uh, and Cody, if you're online, call it out. Um, but what, that, what was that research about as a scoping review and what did it tell us about um, preventing drowning in this area? Yeah, so first things first, I can't clarify his surname. I've <laughs> collaborated with him a few times, chat on WhatsApp all the time, so I'll take that down for further action. Um, but, yes, Cody led us in a, a literature review. We had some discussion about uh, snorkelling and, and scuba diving-related drowning and realised actually we needed to look at the state of the science first of all. So Cody led us in a literature review, um, and what we found is that outside of Australia actually there is very little data looking at this issue um, so first of all I would encourage anyone around the world with this kind of data to hand to, to publish it or make it available and, and we did look at grey literature as well so not just in the academic space but just making this data available um, so yeah we really first of all as researchers tend to do called for more data and more research um, but we did make a number of recommendations uh, including some of the things that John has mentioned so really some of the key things were those medical conditions um, the buddy system also touching on the tourism perspective as well and as John has mentioned you know Queensland is really leading the way in that sense with codes of practice and in talking about a systems approach that's probably something that we could encourage other jurisdictions to to uh, improve but we also just had a wide range of uh, activities that people were doing, I guess, when they were snorkeling. So we have, um, you know, the, the recreational element, might be locals, might be tourists, um, but we also have the, the fishing and fishing for survival and sustenance for food and, and cultural practices with fishing. Um, and then we also have the occupational element as well. So it's quite a diverse field where, you know, Australia is leading the way in terms of the evidence, but there is a lot more we need to learn and a, a lot more we can do regarding prevention. Mm. Sure, John, put your hand up. Yeah. One, of the, <laughs> one of the interesting things too, uh, you know, we're talking about the cardiac issue with, with snorkelling, for instance, and that's a, a big issue in Queensland where you get a lot of older tourists coming in there with uh, snorkelling on the barrier reef on their bucket list. And so we get a fair incidence of cardiac issue there. Um, whereas in other parts of Australia, it's more young active experienced spearfisher people, spearfisher men mainly, who die, who drown uh, primarily and often because they're extended breath holding. So they get what, what I call breath holding blackout where they're sort of extending their breath holding, going down quite leap, deep for quite a long time and blackout before they come to the surface or shortly after surfacing. And if they don't have a, a very vigilant buddy there to grab them, get their head out of the water and uh, manage them, they often drown. So that's a big issue. And the other thing in, in New Zealand is I've just done a series of uh, snorkel fatalities and scuba fatalities in New Zealand. And one of the, it's a big issue there with seafood hunting uh, and especially in the Maori community. And the skills aren't necessarily there. The equipment isn't necessarily there. A lot of people go spearing in bad conditions or, or um, power collecting in, in bad conditions without fins on, for instance. So, you know, it varies in, in different communities. 
And just let me say one thing about the cardiac issue going into snorkeling and scuba. A lot of people just put it down to the cardiac stress due to exertion of being in that in the water, but it's a lot more than that. As soon as you become immersed, whether you're scuba diving, snorkeling, swimming, you get a redistribution of blood from your legs, for instance, and a fair bit to, from your arms into your chest. And that can be up to 700 mil. And your heart, when it pumps, has to push that away. So you're putting a greater stress on the heart. It has to work harder straight away as soon as you're immersed. And when you add to that wearing a wetsuit, um, wearing other equipment, dragging it around, swimming against currents, aspirating salt water, all those are triggers for a cardiac event. So you've got a, a toxic mix there, a witch's brew that can potentially um, cause problems in a susceptible person. And uh, most of the people that we deal with that I'm examined as fatalities don't know that they're necessarily susceptible people. They've got um, occult disease. And that's again, why we encourage people uh, to go and get medically examined. Another another topic where we could spend uh, a good hour on, no doubt. But which is which is brew has made a whole heap of people on this webinar hungry for their lunch. So um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap uh, wrap the session up now. I'd like to thank you, John, for joining us, and Amy, of course, for joining us throughout the webinar.